Hey everyone, this is Wes. This video is going to cover the basics of the USART system of the ATX Mega 128A1U microcontroller. The ATX Mega 128A1U has a total of eight USART modules, and each of them can be configured to perform either synchronous or asynchronous serial communication. In this presentation, however, the synchronous portion won't be covered. You can find more details in the XMega AU manual. Ports C, D, E, and F all have two UART modules available. Each individual UART will consist of two pins, receive and transmit. The receive pin of one UART would be connected to the transmit pin of another UART and vice versa for the transmit pin. The naming convention for labeling and differentiating each module is as follows. For example, the two UART modules on port C are called USART C0 and USART C1. This table is from the alternate pin function section of the DOC 8385 manual. In this example, we're looking at which pins are for the UART modules on port C. These tables are your best reference for determining which physical pins are utilized for a given peripheral. For USART C0, we can see that RX is connected to pin 2 on port C and TX is connected to pin 3 on port C. Similarly, for USART C1, we can see that RX is connected to pin 6 on port C and TX is connected to pin 7. This pattern is the same for the USART modules on ports D, E, and F, which also support USART. For example, the RX and TX pins for USART D0 are pins 2 and 3, and for USART D1, they are pins 6 and 7 as well. Now let's talk about what each UART module looks like. This is a block diagram from the manual for each UART module. There are three major sections. The first section is the clock generator section, which generates the clock signals required for the transmitter and the receiver to function properly. The transmitter section shifts data out via the transmit pin at the specified baud rate, as well as implements the parity. The receiver section samples data via the receive pin. The clock generation section contains a fractional baud rate generator that uses the peripheral clock to generate the baud rate. F per is the frequency of the peripheral clock which is derived from the overall system clock. In some instances, it may be desired to have the peripheral operate at a lower frequency than the overall system, though this is not particular to UART. Shown here is a block diagram of the UART's clock generation hardware. It's responsible for generating a wide range of baud rates such that it's possible to interface with external UARTs. Note that the receiver's clock is 16 times faster than the transmitter's clock. As the highlighted portion here indicates, the transmitter's clock is passed through a series of prescalers, resulting in a 16 times reduction. More details about why this is necessary can be found in section 23.8 of the DOC 8331 manual. To configure a UART module to operate at a specific baud rate, the equations in the table shown here are utilized. The three parameters that can be modified are the peripheral clock frequency, baud select, and B scale. Don't really worry about it if you've never heard of some of these parameters, um, more details will be provided in the following slides. The adjacent equations in the third and fourth columns are equivalent, but in the third column, the baud rate is calculated, and in the fourth column, a baud select value is calculated. Note that the clock 2x bit can be set to allow for higher or doubled baud rates. This may be necessary for some applications. For more details, see the rest of this table in the manual. This table will definitely be a very commonly used resource so make sure you bookmark it some way so that you can reference it in the future. The baud rate generated is determined by the period setting, baud select, an optional scale setting, B scale, and the peripheral clock frequency, F pair. Generally, the first step when configuring a UART module is to determine the baud rate. The two UARTs that are communicating must have identical or as close to identical as possible baud rates. An example would be connecting a microcontroller and communicating via UART with a computer serial port. You have to configure both of their baud rates to be as close as possible for the communication to work. Now I'll go into a little more detail about the parameters that are used to determine the baud rate. The peripheral clock frequency is 2 MHz by default on the XMega, and as mentioned earlier, it's derived from the system clock. Baud select is a period value between 0 and 4095, and V scale or baud scale is a value in the range of negative 7 to plus 7 that's used to fine-tune the baud rate. A note in the table below that there's two separate sets of equations, one for when B scale is negative and one for when B scale is greater than or equal to zero. 
Before learning how to properly initialize the UART system, it's necessary to know how an XMEGA UART frame is composed. Below is an illustration of one. Note that any bits in the frame encapsulated by brackets in this diagram are optional, and thus the frame can be configured to exclude them. Each frame always begins with a start bit, followed by the data bits, of which there can be anywhere from 5 to 9. The next is the parity bit, which is optional. If enabled, it can be configured to implement either even or odd parity. Finally, the frame is always terminated with at least one stop bit, but it can be configured to have two stop bits. After the stop bit or bits, either of two things could happen. The communication line could go to the idle state, indicated by a high voltage level, or another frame could begin immediately, indicated by another start bit. Now we can discuss the steps required to initialize the UART system for asynchronous communication. For the next portion of this presentation, we go through the recommended initialization procedure. According to the manual, the transmit pin needs to be configured as an output with a high voltage level initially, the baud rate needs to be configured, the frame format and communication mode need to be set, and finally, the transmitter and or receiver need to be enabled if applicable. Optionally, interrupts can be utilized, and this requires additional configurations. Let's talk about the first step, initializing the transmit pin. The transmit pin should only be initialized if the UART's transmitter is to actually be utilized. If so, the transmit pin must be configured as an output. In some cases, a UART may only ever need to receive data, such as receiving commands or something from another device. Additionally, the output value for this pin should be set high such that the communication line is initially in the idle state. This ensures that there are no false start conditions interpreted by any other UART device that's connected to this pin. It's very important, as with typical I.O. pin initialization, to configure the pin's output value before setting the direction as output. After we've initialized the transmit pin, we can set the baud rate using the baud control A and B registers. To configure the baud rate, the baud select and the baud scale bit fields must be initialized. These bit fields are within the baud control A and baud control B registers as shown below. Also make note that the lower 8 bits of the baud select value are in baud control A and the upper 4 bits are in baud control B. To better understand how to initialize the baud rate, let's do a simple example. Our goal will be to configure the baud rate to approximately 9600 bits per second. To do this, we need to determine a proper baud select value, assume the B scale equals 0, and the peripheral clock frequency is 2 MHz. This is the equation we use for this example. Refer to the table of baud rate equations that was covered earlier in the presentation. This equation was chosen because B scale is 0, and our goal is to calculate a baud select value. I'd like to emphasize that this is not always the equation to use. It depends on multiple parameters of the application. You'll need to reference the aforementioned table to determine which equation to use each time you configure a UART module. After plugging in the known parameters, we get a baud select value of approximately 12.02. The baud select value must be an integer, so we'll round the result to 12. Now let's see how close our generated baud rate will be after having to round our baud select value slightly. Plugging 12 back into the equation, for baud select, we can calculate the baud rate to be about 9,615 bits per second. This would be an error of about 0.16%, which is acceptable for most use cases. It's important to check the actual baud rate that will get configured, because in some cases, if the baud select value has to be heavily rounded, the percent error may be too high, causing transmission problems. The application dictates how much error is acceptable, an application should be tested thoroughly to ensure there are no frame or transmission errors occurring. As mentioned in the previous slides, the B-scale parameter can be used to fine-tune the baud rate, which would minimize any associated error. Now that we've done the math to determine the baud select value, we can initialize the baud control registers, baud control A and B. Since we've determined baud select will be 12, and B-scale was given the example to be 0, We'll load the lower 8 bits of the baud select value, which in this case is the entire value of 12, into the baud control A register. If the baud select value is greater than 255, in other words, the upper 4 bits were non-zero, we would store those upper 4 bits into the lower nibble of the baud control B register, as seen below. The entire 4-bit B scale value must be written to the upper nibble of the baud control B register, 
Since the B scale value can be negative, the value must be stored in two's complement format. After these two registers are initialized, the baud rate is all set and we can move on. The next thing we have to do is set the frame format and the mode of operation, and both of these are done using the control C register. Let's start with the operation mode. The operation mode for a UART module is configured by the C mode bit field. For this course, we'll generally use the asynchronous mode, thus setting the bit field to 00. Now moving on to the frame format, this is where we initialize the number of data bits, the style of parity to be used, if any, as well as the number of stop bits. For parity, the parity mode or P mode bit field specifies which type of parity is used, if any. If parity is enabled, the transmitter will automatically generate and send the parity of the data bits within each frame. The next part of the frame that we can configure is the number of stop bits. The stop bit mode bit determines whether one or two stop bits will be used by the transmitter to terminate each UART frame. The character size bit field determines the number of data bits contained within each frame. As seen in the table, we can choose 5-bit, 6-bit, 7-bit, 8-bit, and finally 9-bit. Note that the transmitter and receiver must have the same configuration. The last mandatory part of the initialization is to enable the transmitter and or the receiver, depending on the use case. This is done using the control B register. In some applications, as stated earlier, it may not be necessary for both the transmitter and the receiver to be enabled, so they can be done independently. The control B register contains two bits that allow us to independently enable and disable the receiver and transmitter. The first of which is RXEN, which enables the receiver, and the second is TXEN, which enables the transmitter. Both of these bits, when set, will override the normal pin function of the receive and transmit pins. After the required initializations are complete, if you'd like to use UART interrupts, you can enable them and choose a desired priority level using the control A register. But before we talk specifically about enabling interrupts, I'll need to explain how to even begin a UART transmission or read any data that has been received. The transmit and receive data buffer registers share the same I.O. memory address, which is referred to as the UART data register. Data written to the data register goes to the transmit buffer to be transmitted. Conversely, when data is received by the receiver, it gets stored into the receive buffer register and this register can be accessed by reading the data register. The data register is ultimately what you'll use to initiate transmissions and load any data that you have received. You'll read from and write to it, yielding different results, which can be confusing at first, but with some practice and doing some examples, it'll start to make sense. Each XMega UART module is capable of generating three different interrupts. One for when the receive buffer has new data to be read, one for when all of the data in the transmit buffer has been sent, and another that indicates data can be written to the data register. Each of these three interrupts has an interrupt flag associated with it, the first of which is the receive complete interrupt flag. The receive complete interrupt flag is bit 7 of the UART status register. It is set when there are unread data in the receive buffer. It's cleared when the receive buffer is empty, in other words, it does not contain any unread data. For example, Immediately after reading the receive buffer, if there is no new data to be read, the receive complete interrupt flag will be cleared. When interrupt driven data reception is used, the receive complete interrupt routine must, re must read the received data from the data register in order to clear the receive interrupt flag. If the receive complete interrupt is used, there's no need to manually pull the receive complete interrupt flag anymore, which means the program does not need to be halted doing any sort of polling. The next interrupt flag we'll discuss is the transmit complete interrupt flag. This one is not used as frequently, but it's still important to understand. The transmit complete interrupt flag is set when two conditions are met. The entire frame in the transmit shift register has been shifted out, and there are no new data in the transmit buffer. It is automatically cleared when the transmit complete interrupt vector is executed, and alternatively, it can be manually cleared by writing a 1 to its bit location in the status register. The next flag is the data register empty flag, which is bit 5 in the status register. This flag indicates whether the transmit buffer is ready to receive new data or not. This bit is 1 when the transmit buffer is empty, and 0 when the transmit buffer contains data to be transmitted that has not yet been moved into the shift register. 
Always write the data register empty flag to zero when writing to the status register. An example of when you would need to write to the status register is if you're writing, trying to clear the transmit complete interrupt flag. The bit is also cleared by writing to the data register. Now finally, let's get to actually enabling the UART interrupts. The control A register contains three bit fields, and each of the bit fields corresponds to one of the three interrupts. Receive complete, transmit complete, and data register empty. Each of these bit fields contain two bits that enable and set the interrupt priority for each interrupt, following the PMIC guidelines. Each of these interrupts is triggered by its corresponding interrupt flag in the status register. An example of the naming convention for the interrupt vectors is shown here to the left. This excerpt was taken from the assembly include file for the XMEGA. In this case, the USART C0 module is shown, but the other three modules are named similarly. And of course, the addresses for the vectors are all different. So that concludes the UART initialization procedure. Now let's move on to how to actually transmit and receive data with UART. One of the most basic actions we can perform with UART is transmitting a single frame of data. By now, we know that to transmit a frame, we must write the data we wish to transmit to the data register. To do this properly, however, we must first check that there is not already data there that has not been transmitted yet. Before writing to the data register, we'll check whether the data register empty flag is set or not. If it is set, that means there is room in the register and we can proceed to write the data. If it is not set, that means there's still data that is waiting to be sent to the transmit shift register. The status register is repeatedly read and the data register empty interrupt flag is checked each time until it is a one. Because the data register empty flag is now one, we can safely write the data to the data register, ensuring no data is lost or overwritten. Finally, we'll talk about how to actually receive a frame of data. The flowchart on the right depicts one method of properly reading a received UART frame using a manual polling method. To receive a frame, data must be read from the data register. The receive complete interrupt flag indicates there is new unread data to be read from the data register. To wait for a frame to be received, pull the status register until the receive complete interrupt flag is set and then read from the data register. Note that this method will halt the program while waiting for a frame to be received. For some applications, this may be a bad thing, but for other applications, it may be desired. Using a receive complete interrupt would remove the need to manually pull the flag, freeing up the main program to do other things. So overall, the XMEGA's USART system can be set up pretty quickly while maintaining a lot of flexibility. Section 23 of the XMEGA AU manual contains all the details you may need to learn regarding the USART system that you didn't learn here. Section 33.2 of the device datasheet contains a collection of alternate pin function tables, one of which was shown as an example earlier in the presentation. This is where you should go anytime you need to determine which physical pins on the XMEGA are used for certain peripheral functions, for example, the UART transmit and receive pins. This presentation only really introduced the common features of the USART system. There's still some things you need to discover on your own by completing labs, doing examples, and experimenting with your programs.